Okay, let's get started. It's 10 o'clock uh, Eastern time in the United States. Uh, welcome everyone. And thank you for uh, coming to this uh, panel. And today we have five uh, great presentations and hopefully you will uh, enjoy their uh, presentation and uh, have lots of questions for them. So uh, without further ado, and I will, uh, you know, uh, introduce our first speaker, Antoine Isak, who is the R&D manager at uh, Europeana Foundation and, and for the Europeana project. Um, I, I think the bioinformation is uh, already available on the website, so I will not take, a, you know, the precious time to do extra repeat the bioinformation Go ahead, please. Let's welcome uh, Antoine for the, uh, to give us the first presentation. Thank please. you very much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the, uh, the warm welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, invited here. Uh, thanks a lot. So I am going to first share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, in presentation mode now. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, I'm going to uh, to to open this uh, this panel by uh, by presenting some some aspects of uh, of entity management at uh, at Europeana. Uh, actually, not not only management, because I'm I'm going to give a bit uh, a bit of the context around and the motivation. Hopefully, uh, setting the scene for. Uh, why we are doing some things and uh, and what are the challenges that uh, that we are facing. Uh, so, uh, first a bit of background about uh, Europeana. Uh, so we are this uh, this uh, uh, service uh, funded by the European Union. Uh, we publish uh, 55, uh, 52 million digitized objects on our on our site, uh, and and our website uh, provides an access to digital cultural heritage. Uh, via metadata that is sent to us uh, from uh, slightly over 4,000 libraries, archives, and museums uh, in 44 countries. So that's uh, that's quite a lot of metadata. It is diverse. It is in uh, in very many languages. Uh, so we 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 face a, a lot of problems when when trying to provide a unified service on, on top of uh, on top of all this. So uh, what we do, and I, I'm not going to expand a lot because uh, uh, actually we've presented that in some, some earlier uh, DCMI conferences, uh, we try to enrich uh, our metadata. So we, uh, we built a data model called European Data Model, EDM, uh, that gives us a, ba a base for linking to multilingual semantic metadata. Uh, so trying to, uh, to follow the, the principles of linked open data. And the first thing that this enables us to do is to get uh, some uh, local or external vocabularies from our data providers, so the, the cultural heritage partners that give us metadata. Uh, so we can we can get them link from them links to uh, to CISORI, to authority list uh, that gives us some context around the uh, the cultural heritage objects like the paintings or the sculptures that they uh, they send us. Uh, so here's here's a list of the, the sort of uh, of things that we can sort of harvest uh, from the uh, the semantic references that uh, our providers send us. Uh, well, I, I guess uh, the TCMI audience will recognize uh, uh, many well-known vocabularies uh, there. But we actually have a, a, a sort of diverse range of uh, of well-known vocabularies and things that are a bit more customized. Uh, to uh, to some some needs. So this is what we get uh, from the providers' metadata, and, and in parallel, uh, we try to apply by ourselves some automatic enrichment to link the object metadata to some reference data sets uh, for places, persons, concepts. So to complement what the providers give us, but also to uh, to try to unify it uh, a bit. Uh, and for this, uh, we are building what we call an entity collection. Uh, which is uh, aimed to be a centralized point of reference uh, for data about contextual entities in Europeana. Again, places, agents, concepts. Uh, so we build this by 
uh, caching and curating data that we gather from the wider Linktoven data cloud. Uh, and, and basically, it, it gives us, uh, in the end, a sort of European knowledge graph uh, that we can use to, uh, to provide better access to the collections that we, uh, that we serve. And this is available via a specific API, which uh, I will come back to a bit, uh, a bit later. Uh, so, with respect to the, the data that's currently held in this uh, entity collection, so uh, well, the, the figures are here on this slide. Uh, I'm not going to expand on it. It's it's very varying depending on the the types of entities. Uh, we also uh, fetch uh, data from from various uh, different places. So I'm, I'm not going to enter into the uh, the detail of each data source that we we get. It's it's mostly coming from GeoNames, Wikipedia, and Wikidata. Uh, but there are some uh, some other things uh, that are hanging around. Uh, so diving into the data, this is uh, uh, the sort of uh, statements that we have uh, for an entity. So here in this case, uh, Mozart. So uh, there's a URI uh, and uh, the entity uh, API provides with all kinds of labels in uh, many languages. Uh, some connections to other kind of entities like, like places uh, and uh, the co-reference uh, links to other data sets uh, such as uh, DVpedia or Wikidata. Actually, uh, most of these links point back to the data sources that we have built the collection from. Uh, of course, uh, we love uh, gathering data, but uh, we don't do it for the sake of gathering data. Uh, so the entity collection is meant uh, really to improve the user experience on the European services. Uh, first, uh, improve the findability. Uh, people uh, search on our website uh, for uh, people, places, and subjects, and then from these on, they expect to find relevant uh, artifacts. Uh, so, and they do that in many languages. Uh, and we would like to serve this. We would also like to uh, use the entities to uh, disambiguate the queries that we receive. Uh, Sometimes uh, a, a, a string, a query string can be ambiguous. And of course, uh, being able to tell the user as well, do you refer to this entity or this other entity uh, would be a powerful uh, mechanism during, uh, during the search. So we, we can't solve things automatically, but at least uh, we can uh, we can do a bit of uh, uh, UI uh, tricks to uh, to get the search uh, generally work better. And then there is the contextualization, uh, allowing users to see more context about the objects that Europeana serves. Uh, so we have uh, embarked on uh, providing uh, entity pages that group objects and link to uh, to other entities. Uh, so we have two examples here. Uh, so on the left, you see the semantic auto-completion. So a user start typing something, and then they can see uh, some entities from the collection uh, popping up, and they can uh, they can select that, and that will trigger a search for that specific uh, entity, which thus will be uh, a bit more precise. And then on the right, uh, the entity page for uh, for Johannes Vermeer, uh, where we can see. Uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of objects related to Vermeer, but also uh, relation to other entities uh, such as uh, watercolor painting, drawing, engraving, uh, etc. Uh, a, a specific uh, focus here on multilinguality. Uh, so this uh, this is a magnified view of the the previous screenshot. Uh, you, we can see the links uh, to other entities from the page for, for Vermeer. Uh, and when we switch to another language, uh, then, well, basically a lot of things on this page get translated uh, to, uh, to that other language, so in that case, uh, German. And uh, it's important to recognize that on the translated page, uh, there are some translations that come from, well, let's say the UI machinery. Uh, so labels uh, that uh, that are statically uh, translated to uh, to German, uh, but uh, some translation they also come from uh, this knowledge graph that we are we are building. So the labels of the entities uh, they are pulled uh, live from the information that we have in the entity collection. It's it's not part uh, of the static UI uh, mechanisms. 
So we, uh, we give access to all entities uh, at once for those who want to see all the entities. And well, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, an overwhelming site here, but uh, the idea really is that users, when they are interested in the topic, they can pick an entity and then start browsing deeper into your piano. Uh, an interesting side effect is that we can also use these to organize uh, the data for organizations and prom promote them a bit uh, a bit better. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this is a page for a project that's related to Europeana called Carari, uh, working on uh, on archaeology uh, stuff uh, mostly. And the page uh, can be used to provide a sort of specific aspect, uh, specific access to the collection uh, of that provider. So that's for the, the general purpose uh, of the, uh, the entity collection. So diving a bit behind uh, on how we manage uh, and curate uh, those things. Uh, so we've got a process in place uh, whereby uh, from the original data, uh, there is, uh, there is a, a bunch of scripts for importing and integrating the, the data, uh, putting that in, uh, in the database itself, and then it gets exposed. Uh, via uh, the Entity Collection API. Uh, and uh, that is used uh, by the European portal and any third party applications that would like to reuse uh, the data that we've assembled. Uh, so for example, uh, for DBpedia, uh, we, uh, we do get the terms, uh, then uh, those terms are loaded in a triple store and uh, using some RDF queries, uh, we extract uh, the statements that we are interested in and we integrate them in, uh, in the entity collection, uh, which in terms of database is forwarded by uh, a NoSQL database. Uh, another example, uh, the organization. So I, I don't have uh, a diagram here because it's even more complex. Uh, we actually pull some data from our content relationship, uh, sorry, customer relationship management system uh, that hosts uh, basic information about all our partners uh, we have added some manual translation uh, of the names of the organization into English. At the same time, we have pulled some data from Wikidata uh, to complement what we had in our systems. Uh, and uh, we have also changed uh, the internal workings uh, for the object metadata so that it would really point to these new entities that represent the organizations uh, that contribute data to your piano. So it's basically mixing things uh, from uh, three, and three or four different, uh, different sources. Uh, then uh, once the entities are, uh, let's say, loaded for the first time in the entity collection, uh, there, is, uh, there is a process uh, for either adding new entities uh, sort of manually uh, or for curating uh, the entities by editing some metadata about them. Uh, so in the previous slides that I showed, uh, the uh, addition of new entities uh, was very time consuming. Basically, it would require to undergo one of those complex mechanisms to pull things uh, from uh, existing linked data, which is not necessarily what uh, some of our partners are interested in. Uh, they have a focus on a, a specific topic, uh, and they would like this topic to be properly represented in the entity collection. Uh, so we uh, we provide a, a service that allows the creation of new entities uh, a, a bit more, uh, well, let's say, from, from experts. Uh, and of course, they can still do that by adding some references to external link data sources. So if there's a partner very interested in archaeology and they would like to sort of uh, include and then own uh, a topic of archaeology within the entity collection, they can uh, add it and then they say, oh, well, uh, this topic also is present in Wikidata, so you can pull all the translations that are available there, uh, which will save some time for the, for the curator of the entity collection. Uh, they can also adjust uh, the data that is pulled out of uh, the external sources. Uh, so sometimes uh, the, the statements that are uh, obtained from, uh, from Wikidata or Wikipedia or others, they are not a great fit for your piano. Uh, and uh, so that, that was a, a bit of, uh, of feedback that we got very, uh, very early uh, in the process, uh, actually from our colleagues, even before we provide the service to, uh, to, to our partners. Uh, so uh, a, 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 
a, a small uh, component has been uh, developed so that the descriptions can be edited uh, by, uh, by the curator. So again, we are not expecting that this will happen on a massive scale, uh, but when a partner has a good reason to do so, they can do it. Uh, continuing on the this curation uh, aspect, an important uh, point is to be able to showcase uh, really relevant items on an entity page. Uh, so I, I've mentioned a bit earlier that uh, Europeana does uh, automatic enrichment, and that's, uh, that's of course uh, error prone. And some partners who have a vested interest in some entity uh, are often interested in uh, making sure that the first items that are returned, uh, that are visible on the entity page, uh, are very relevant. Uh, sometimes it means that uh, they want uh, their own collections to be uh, to be featured on that entity page. But that's that's fair. That's fair enough. Uh, we we find so uh, we've we've developed a uh, a, a small tool uh, that allows uh, those partners to uh, to select uh, the top items appearing on the entity page. So it's sort of developed uh, on top of a of a tool that we have to create a user sets, so where users of Europeana can create their own groupings of objects. So a partner can create their own grouping for an entity, and that will uh, be integrated uh, later on onto the display of the, uh, the entity page. Uh, that's, that also works with, uh, with a sort of suggestion mechanism uh, with an AI-based recommendation engine that sort of shows those partners what kind of objects they, uh, they may want to, to showcase. So we also have uh, a sort of, uh, of a statistic dashboard for the, the entity collection uh, that gives an overview of, uh, of the data that we have, uh, which can be especially uh, useful to monitor uh, the coverage that we have uh, for, uh, for the various languages uh, that Europeana uh, has to serve, uh, also to, to see what kind of curation efforts are, are happening, that, that sort of stuff. So it's, it's fairly basic, but uh, it is actually quite useful to, to see what is happening and what actually needs, needs to happen. Because I said, the entities for us are very useful to provide multilingual services. Uh, so it's very interesting to know that, uh, for example, uh, we have a gap in the coverage of, uh, of agents in, uh, uh, well, in, uh, in Dutch or, uh, or Polish. So that, that would also uh, guide us towards uh, later data enrichment efforts. Uh, so challenges, uh, I guess we're going to discuss uh, them in more in more detail in the coming the coming time. So I, I I've just uh, gathered uh, a couple of slides that uh, that give the big the big line. Uh, so of course we do have uh, technical challenges, and I I could spend hours. Uh, discussing them. Uh, actually, some of them I've already reported in a, in a presentation at, at DCMI 2018. So we were already starting to, to work on, on the entity collection and identifying uh, some challenges. They are still there. Uh, so uh, building and managing that, uh, that sort of entity knowledge graph requires uh, quite some tedious modeling work, uh, even more tedious data integration. Uh, and uh, well, quite some sophisticated efforts for designing uh, uh, the APIs and the infrastructure that, uh, that sustain them. Uh, because it's not only about serving uh, data on entity, but there's also uh, enabling uh, data update, uh, searching for entities, and, and that includes things like, like ranking. Uh, so what, what should be the, the basis for ranking entities in a, in a search? So this, this raises all kind of uh, all kinds of issues that are not trivial to, to fix. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when we develop a, a service for, uh, for entity data, uh, then, of course, that has an impact on all the related platforms uh, that consume, uh, consume this data, both in terms of design and implementation. So there is a bit of back and forth uh, between the development of the European portal, the curation environment, the monitoring needs, and uh, the back end. Uh, which uh, which is in the uh, the API and the and the data itself. But technical challenges are not uh, the only thing that one should focus on, and this is uh, this is something that that we've learned 
uh, over the, the past couple of years, I, I would say. Uh, there are plenty of organizational challenge to get everyone by the ID uh, of such a knowledge graph and what, what it can bring uh, to, uh, to an organization and, and how it should be, it should be handled. Uh, it also uh, requires appropriate efforts to get people uh, involved in the curation, so either to select entities uh, or to edit the metadata or to build the right links between entities and, and items. Do things which, uh, which are actually uh, fairly crucial uh, for the very first point, which is to, uh, that everyone would buy into the, uh, the idea of an entity-based uh, system. Uh, and of course, it requires quite, uh, quite some planning. So there are many stakeholders that need to be, uh, to be aligned and, uh, and synchronized. Uh, I've referred to, uh, to a previous presentation that I gave on, on the technical aspect, uh, and, and that would be my, my conclusion, is that the, those, those various challenges and those two levels of technical and organizational actually uh, seem together, they often require some, some shifting of priorities. So we started with uh, a, an idea that we would build a very uh, uh, well, let's say nice knowledge graph, and we would try to solve all the technical issues. Uh, but actually, halfway, uh, our colleagues at Europeana said, well, but you know what, maybe uh, we should focus on simple things like uh, being able uh, to, to change a description when it's not good, uh, rather than to see how to combine descriptions from, uh, from Wikidata and 10 other different databases. Uh, so there's, there's a bit of, uh, of flexibility that is required. And, uh, especially being able to hear uh, what all the stakeholders around this have to say uh, for them to, uh, to make sense of, of such an effort. So with this, I uh, would like to, uh, to thank you and uh, I'm welcoming any specific questions uh, that you would have on, on Europeana's work uh, before we, we move on to, the, to the, next, uh, the next presentation of the panel. Great. Thank you. Uh, this is a great presentation, um, and uh, I uh, we we can spend time take uh, one or two questions, uh, quicker ones. Um, anyone from the audience? If uh, yeah, we can uh, the next presentation can move on to uh, get started. So I don't see anyone uh, asking question because uh, maybe because this is a so complicated project and I do have a question, but I, I would uh, um, wait till the end to ask uh, uh, my question. Um, Let's welcome um, Chui, Chui Jian Xia uh, from Shanghai Library to give us a presentation. Um, Chui Jian Xia is a researcher as well as a system uh, librarian at uh, uh, Shanghai Library. And she's been working on uh, the linked data project for uh, humanities, um, you know, resources for a long time. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is my screen okay? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Xia Zhen from Shanghai Library. It's a pleasure to talk about the integrated workflow of entity management and the service for digital humanities in Shanghai Library. Maybe there is something of my presentation uh, similar with my last presentation, but I try to explain it in the view of entity management and service. Firstly, the current situation and problems during the past few years of developing digital amenities systems. Since 2000 and 15, we have developed many digital amenities projects one by one. Uh, we have transformed the silos of digital library system into 
the interlinked knowledge base is based on ontology and linked open data technologies. Until now, we have developed more than 20 knowledge bases with more than 300 millions of RDF triples. Here is the process. Firstly, we transform all metadata records of different resources in different formats into RDF triples. Take authors, contributors, publishers, and organizations, events and places as entities, but not as strings. And give every entity core URI as global identifier and locator, and then link them together after name entity recognition and entity disambiguation. And then enrich more semantic data about the entities by extracting structured data from the content of digital resource objects or open data sets on the web, like Wikidata, uh, maybe the Chinese version. And uh, provide author authority control and the knowledge linking service among resources of different kinds of collections in a web scale. So uh, we can provide digital humanity services for researchers and open data APIs for the third party developers. We have built different knowledge bases, which we call basic knowledge bases for different kinds of entities. For example, the name authority database for persons and also for organizations, places, events, and the physical objects uh, like architectures and the landmarks. The basic knowledge bases with entities are the Lincoln hubs for the digital resource objects in the special collections knowledge bases. Uh, the digital resource objects with metadata are linked to the entities with HTTP URIs, semantically defined by the one ontology abstract model. And there are restful APIs of one knowledge base to provide data service for all the others. Every basic knowledge base and special connection knowledge base has its own user interface to provide services for the end users. And there are some mobile web applications for the citizens and tourists who want to know the history about Shanghai through accessing uh, the detailed data of entities and the resources. But there are difficulties during the data cleaning and name entity recognition. Firstly, we have to correct the inconsistency of metadata records in digital library system and deal with the entity disambiguation manually. It means we have so much work to do to transform a digital library system into a semantic knowledge base. Secondly, we haven't an integrated workflow to support the process of entity ex extraction, creation, modification, Publishing and the service. And we have some solutions. There should be an integrated workflow to bridge the gaps among the different stages of the entity management process, such as the digitalization, data production, data cleaning. Uh, name entity recognition and the linked open data publication. And the new technologies such as machine learning, we can use to make the OCR and the NER work more efficiently. The service interfaces of so many knowledge bases need to be integrated to support search across knowledge bases and the realizations for social networks and the spatial temporal analysis based on entities and the relations among entities in one platform. Now I will talk about the semantic content architecture of entity management. 
the ontology abstract model integrated all different kinds of entities and resources together. It's based on one unified ontology for data modeling and linked open data technologies for data publishing, interlinking, and open access. The one unified ontology is composed of server ontology application profiles of different kinds of entities and special collections. The vocabulary is a, uh, uh, the vocabularies of this ontology application profile were published on, on this website. Uh, the ontology application profile uh, mentioned uh, in my last uh, presentation, uh, I understand is a set of formal definitions encoded by machine readable language, including the definitions of classes and the properties, the domain and the range of the properties, and the most importantly, the constraints, which are designed to meet the specific requirements in you know, specific applications. Maybe there are different constraints for the same properties in different ontology application profile. This is the data model of organization ontology application profile, which mainly extends schema.org and W3C organization ontology. And uh, we also have, a, uh, have an organization knowledge base uh, published with linked open data technologies. This is the core and the extension data model of ontology application profile of person, which can describe the personal information, relationships, official experience, and other important events during a person's life, and the different contribution which the person made for the resources such as books, photos, archives, and so on. This is the data model of ontology application profile of place and temporal, which can handle different level of places such as road, county, province, and country, and the multiple kinds of representation of Chinese chrono chronology, and also the relations among place, temporal, and other kinds of entities. This is the data model of ontology application profile of event. It can describe events happened to a person, organization, place, or any other kinds of entities. Now we are designing a data process platform, which can integrate the data acquisition, processing, and service workflow together. The main task of this data process platform is to deal with the data life cycle during every stage of the whole workflow. Make the data can be tracked, traced, and returned to the previous stage or version and, uh, and uh, reuse or maintain the existing data of the knowledge bases. All right. Uh, let's take the genealogy union cataloging system as an example. It is a pilot project of the data process platform. Uh, the main purpose of this system is to help catalogers of multiple organizations cataloging one system and output the catalog data into the service platform as soon as the workflow finish. It has realized the unified management of the whole workflow of order and donation, union cataloging across organizations, authority control in a web scale, statistics and analysis, uh, data import and export, and the integration with folio holdings management system and the service platform. 
This is the interface for the catalogers. While they need to input a place name, they can select a place with an HTTP URI from the place knowledge base instead of inputting a framework a free word. And for the temporal, the catalogers just need to input the number of a year. Then the Chinese history year is created automatically by request the APIs provided by the Chinese history chronology knowledge base. By this way, the data of the existing knowledge bases can be reused. And also, we don't need to clean the words inputting improperly by the catalog catalogers. Finally, I will share some interesting use cases about the services that the basic knowledge bases with entities support. Every basic knowledge with entities can be taken as a data linking hub. The same, uh, the name authority database with person entities is a good example. Every person entity has rich relations with the other entities. And the system provides APIs for all service applications and the tools of the service platform. And based on these APIs in the application scenarios of service platform, users can explore all kinds of rela relationships among people, other entities, and all kinds of digital resources in a social network system. And this, the place names with GIS technologies can help users search and visualize big data on one map. We are developing a historical GIS data architecture with spatial temporal data and GIS technologies. Now the search results can display on the map and the user can search all the entities and the resources of different knowledge bases on the map by inputting keywords or drawing a polygon. We also have a event knowledge base about the cultural history of Shanghai, which can bring all entities and digital resources related to the event together. Here is an uh, example about how to use entities from genealogy documents as evidence for migration history study. As we know, Genealogy documents is a kind of typical folk literature, which is considered to be not reliable. But the researchers of migration history also take the genealogy documents as a very important source of evidence. If there are multiple sources of evidence for cross-reference. In Shanghai Library's data infrastructure, all kinds of digital resources and entities are interconnected. So it's easy to put the multiple sources of evidence together for cross-reference. Furthermore, the content of a genealogy document is transformed into semantic data, which can be com computed and analyzed and realized. Especially the data of migration events can be realized and interactive on the map, it becomes a new source of evidence for the migration history study. In order to show the cultural memory of Wukong Road and help, citizen, uh, help citizens or tourists know the stories about this famous street in Shanghai, we developed a mobile web application which is simply a front end for data presentation and navigation. The data comes from the various knowledge bases and the multi-dimensional multi data we think can tell the stories about this street, about the architectures 
and the people related to this street. For those scanned images, which are very difficult to use current OCR technologies, we use two crowdsourcing methods to get text from images. The one is transcription online. We developed a crowdsourcing transcription website to publish and manage transcription tasks on the web, and the users can apply one or more tasks to finish. The other is capture. We divided the scanned images into image segments. When the user logs in every system of Shanghai Library, they need to input the words on the image segments. Maybe they don't know they are helping us to finish the OCR work that a machine cannot do. Okay, that's all of my presentation. Thank you, thanks for you all, and also for the team members of Shanghai Library. Thank you, Cheijun. Uh, this is great. Um, although I um, I know this about this project <laughs> for a long time, it's still new. Uh, like new every time I hear it, um, I learn something new about your project. Um, do we have any? We can take one or two questions. Um, anybody, or should we just wait till the end? Uh, I saw one. Okay. Uh, there is a question from uh, the chat. Um, yeah, yes. Yes, you... yes. Okay. Uh, uh, the article uh, I mentioned uh, uh, on my presentation, the, P uh, the PPT page on my, uh, of my presentation, uh, there is a, a, a link. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Antoine, go ahead. Yeah, I, I've got a, qu a question actually. I mean, it's it's your last slide that that made me think of uh, of, of this. Uh, so because it's uh, I mean it's an amazing project and it's actually uh, really complex as well. So there there are so many things uh, going on, uh, and you've mentioned crowdsourcing, uh, and. Uh, I was wondering, and I, I, I mean, maybe I, I misunderstood, but this crowdsourcing is mostly for for documents. Uh, would it be also for the the entities, the authorities uh, that uh, that you are you yeah. are managing? I, I mean, have you have you considered crowdsourcing next to the the other, like say, professional editing that that happens in other stages uh, of your project? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, for the uh, tra uh, transcription uh, website. Uh, uh, users can uh, uh, add uh, uh, or, uh, the creators uh, and the uh, subject of uh, uh, of um, person, place, events, uh, and so on uh, to uh, the metadata. Uh, not uh, not only for the text of the image, yeah. But could they also, I mean, and maybe not in this transcription specific uh, sub project, but in the in the entities themselves, like if if there is a place, I mean, if, if the people doing the cross sourcing see a place and they realize that there's something wrong with the label or they would like to add something to that place uh, or that subject, is it something that uh, that you've considered? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we can uh, we can uh, allow uh, the users. Uh, uh, add place, uh, person, uh, event, uh, and uh, uh, architecture uh, as uh, as authority data. And uh, uh, when uh, the data is validated uh, by our uh, library, uh, our uh, um, out uh, our export uh, these entities into our a uh, basic knowledge base with entities already here. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much for the clarification. Thank you. Um, the next, great. Uh, I'd like to also add on 
what uh, Che mentioned, they probably are best pioneers for all those crowdsourcing for that genie. When you get the whole history, family history traced back to 72 <laughs> generations of the family, the families contributed directly to that big project. The, yeah, uh, for yeah. The family. Yeah, uh, uh, the uh, genealogy service platform has uh, three kinds of crowdsourcing functions, but uh, uh, because of uh, many, many uh, reasons, uh, the people in, chi in China uh, maybe don't uh, want to uh, contribute uh, their knowledge into a platform uh, that can not give them money. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so the functions is not uh, uh, not uh, very well, uh, uh, not uh, used very very well. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the questions and uh, also uh, for the uh, answering these questions. Uh, because of the time, we have to move on. Uh, otherwise, you know, if anyone has more questions, we can wait till the end. And uh, uh, let's move on to uh, next presentation. Um, our next speaker is Kai Eckert, who is a professor at Stuttgart uh, Media University. And uh, well, let's welcome Kai um, to give his presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I actually also um, have or had questions uh, for both talks that we just heard, uh, but I thought probably I can just use my presentation uh, to, to ask one specific question. Uh, I can only imagine the, 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 the challenges that, um, that both projects before me had. Um, I am in a project that is at a a much smaller scale. And um, we right now focus on one specific question and that is the uh, persistency of the URIs that we use for our entities. And I just want to focus this talk on, on this question and briefly show you what we do um, because one thing for us is for sure we have no resources. So authority control, like you usually do this in a library where you, where you basically curate your entities and your URIs is not possible for us. We always have to plan for, for times where we have not a lot of resources on the project at all. So we have to rely on automatic means. So my, my talk is about entity management in Judaica Link. Judaica Link right now is a knowledge graph embedded in the sub, special subject service for Jewish studies. And what we do is we create a knowledge graph um, for these Jewish studies in its broadest sense, in its broadest sense, and we collect and integrate data from various sources, similar to what we have heard before. Um, we therefore have obviously entities that are described in multiple sources, and we have to or want to have them linked in this knowledge graph. And these links can already exist. Very often they already exist um, when we gather data from the right sources, like from the linked data web, where we already have a rich interlinking. But they can also be added intellectually. And uh, most often, actually, they have to be created automatically. We have several data integration workflows um, that just shows a little bit where we get our data actually from. Um, I put it here in decreasing appeal and fun. So obviously for us, it's easiest and best if we directly can uh, tap on some RDF linked data source, uh, but everything is already for us in the right format. And we usually like for DBpedia or Wikidata, we extract the data that we need for our domain um, and basically create a smaller subset and enrich it with our additional sources. We have a lot of web scraping data 
where we have online encyclopedias that we that we scrape and uh, turn into data. We have APIs. Um, they are often actually harder to use than uh, scraping websites, but that's a different topic. Uh, we have proprietary databases um, that we can use. We often uh, get data offered that uh, should be in databases, uh, but it's not actually a database. It can be Excel files and worse. And the only things that are even worse are all forms of unstructured text. And at the very bottom, of course, are the PDFs where we also try to extract data from. So we have these various sources. And usually when, when, we, when we get data from one source, it is pretty much clear what an entity is in this data source. So if we get data from DBpedia, obviously you have already the URI. If we get data from an encyclopedia, uh, you have an article about an entity and, and this basically identifies the identity. So regarding the, the consistent and clean identification of entities, uh, we have no problems in all our data sources. But as we have these many data sources, we, we need a, a way to navigate these entities on a, on a, in a consistent way um, on a level above our actual data sources. So we link entities that are semantically the same entities, and we want to provide entity pages, uh, similar to what we have seen, for example, in Europeana. We want to have entity pages that are the single entry point for one uh, unique resource, like a person, for example. And the challenge for us is uh, when, when we collect these clusters uh, or when we, when we have these, these linked uh, descriptions from various sources, um, we have to give each cluster a URI. That's not really the challenge. Uh, relatively easy to give a URI to something, but the actual challenge is to maintain these URIs. So what happens when new links get added all links get deleted because our automatic processes uh, have not been correct. So basically the question that we have is, how can you maintain such an authority file basically? How can you do authority control if you do not have the human resources to actually do authority control, but still want to have cool URIs? Uh, we want to be persistent with our identifiers and, and keep them semantically stable. And this is um, especially important because the way how we uh, start to create these entity pages is that we identify these clusters of interlinked resources. And uh, we need, of course, these high linking, and it is very valuable to us, uh, for example, to uh, cross-lingually -lingual, link data sources. A quick example, we have two data sources here, uh, one encyclopedia that uh, uh, links to Minsk, it's in English, it's the Yibo Encyclopedia, and we have a Russian encyclopedia that also talks about Minsk, but uh, uses the Russian language for that. And we have no direct link between these sources. Uh, but we can, uh, by automatic uh, means, relatively uh, uh, with, with a good quality, both link to DBpedia, because DBpedia is a multilingual data resource. And if we establish the link to DBpedia, we can this way also establish a link between the two sources. The problem with this is that we um, inevitably uh, introduce mistakes when we do our automatic linking. And in this case, even worse, these wrong links might propagate um, to several other sources. So we, we can come up actually with, with quite a substantial amount of wrong links in our data. So what can we do about it? Or what, what do we do right now? Um, we want to create entity URIs. The first step is we create this transitive closure of all same S links and identify all clusters of same entities. Then we assign a URI to each cluster. And then we are done if we never touch our data again, then we are fine. Now, this is obviously not possible. So, how do we maintain these entity URIs? And what we do now is that we basically repeat this step. So once we have these cluster URIs, we repeat this step from time to time, whenever our data changes, whenever we adjust our linking 
um, algorithms or get new data. And uh, we again calculate this transitive closure and identify again all clusters of the same entities. And then we have to start to think how we deal with the persistency of the URIs. And we can, uh, we, uh, we can use rules basically um, depending on how the new clusters behave uh, in comparison to the old cluster. And this is just an example. Unfortunately, there are actually much more rules than these four that are depicted here, but I think you can get the idea. We might have the case that the cluster is unchanged. This is simple. We just keep the URI of the entity and everything is fine. We might have the case that we have a new cluster of new resources and entities that are not uh, linked or connected to any resource that was in a cluster before. So everything is new, uh, new descriptions, new data. That's also not a problem. We assign a new URI. Then there are, for example, cases like uh, our new cluster contains an already existing cluster. This basically means we got new data and via our linking, we added new resources to the same entity, but all the old uh, resources that describe the entity are still the same. For us, this means we assume that this is semantically stable and we would keep the old URI and just add the additional resources and link them to the same uh, cluster. And then we have something like partly overlapping clusters. So what happens if the old clusters, they are here in orange, um, if the old clusters look like this and now you have a new cluster that um, overlaps or contains some of the old clusters, but one cluster is, is only partly overlapping. In this case, this cluster has to be split because some of the contained resources now seem to belong to a different entity um, and others seem not to belong to this entity. So that hopefully was, or probably was a, a problem with this. So we have to split it up. Um, otherwise, if we actually uh, contain multiple old clusters, uh, we can just merge them. This happens quite often if we have two, uh, two distinct clusters and via our automatic uh, linking or other means, we just get one additional link that basically uh, uh, links these two clusters together, and then we can just merge them and keep the URI. And this splitting and merging is done in a way that when we merge a cluster, we keep the URI of the largest cluster and create redirects in the form of a was merged property for the other cluster URIs. Uh, in a similar way, when we split a cluster, we create new URIs for all clusters um, that are now available and create a redirect, in this case, was split um, for the old cluster URI. And the idea here is that for one, we want to minimize the overall changes um, of the assigned entity URI. So when we have a huge cluster and we get some new additional resources, we of course try to keep this, uh, this large cluster and just add the others to them. And if they already had a URI, we can just uh, tell everyone that it has been merged, which, which is de facto another all same as them. And the semantic ambiguity cannot be resolved. So when a cluster is split, for example, we then have to assign a new URI and keep the old ones as now ambiguous URIs. That's important for us because, of course, we have to assume that other people already use the, info, um, the URIs, have them in their own data. So if they now again work with our knowledge graph, uh, they will basically see based on this was split uh, property that they actually have an ambiguous URI and they have to figure out um, how to now disambiguate or find the right uh, entity URI in this downstream applications. We can't help them because we actually, we only know that something has split, but we don't know um, how the data was used before when there was obviously a mistake. And of course, it might be that we split a cluster mistakenly. It could be merged again later on. So this inevitably leads to a lot of, um, a lot of movement basically or changes in our entity URIs, but uh, 
as I hopefully described, we do it in a way that the semantic um, 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 uh, meaning of a URI remains the same as much as possible. And we can we basically get a history over what happened uh, with the old URIs if you follow these properties. The lessons we learned so far in this process is um, for consistency and peace of mind, I would say uh, we decided that uh, we really want to have these entity pages for all our resources. You could argue that you only need them if you actually have several resources describing the same entities, but we also want to present them in a specific way and this should be consistent to the user. So we decided to uh, create them for all our resources. Um, we think it's easier to search also and to navigate. Uh, this, of course, leads to many single resource clusters, because not all our resources are really linked. Sometimes we only have one description. Uh, many more times we did not establish the links uh, so far because we did not trust our algorithms or just did not find it yet. Um, this might be a problem uh, and can be avoided, actually. So we, we tested this. Um, you, you can, of course, do this whole approach and just uh, treat these unlinked resources like uh, normal clusters. You just have to do one uh, simple change. If you actually uh, link multiple former unlinked resources, um, they get merged under a new URI because there was not yet an entity page. Um, now we have two advices um, for ourselves, basically, and no solution. Uh, one thing that we found is we should avoid wrong links when we start, because we actually want to avoid cluster splitting as much as we can, because this means we have URIs that are not, um, not uh, or that are ambiguous. But of course, on the other hand, you want to create a lot of links first. So you want to be as perfect as you can when you start uh, this entity generation process um, to avoid these countless merges and merges when you later on um, start to link your resources. Um, obviously, there is not a right solution uh, at some point. You just have to start and uh, accept that uh, then the URIs will basically live on their own and uh, get uh, further maintained. Yeah, that's it. Uh, this is how we right now do this in Judaica link fully automatically. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, here's a quick view on our team. Um, don't think that I have all these people available to me to actually maintain our persistent URIs. Uh, as I said, it's embedded in a, in a larger project. Um, so we still have to see what we do within the knowledge graph. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Um, you know, your uh, use of example of uh, Minsk as and an the Jewish uh, resource, uh, digital resources uh, is already appreciated by our audience. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for a great presentation. And uh, uh, do we have any questions from uh, the audience? We could take one or two. Or um, we'll just wait till the end. Um, okay. Uh, let's move on to our next presentation. And uh, Karen Gracie is uh, the professor at uh, uh, the School of Info Information at Kent State University. Uh, let's welcome Karen's presentation. Hi there. Give me just a second to get my uh, slides queued up here. Uh, just a second. <laughs> I just need to be in the right place. Uh, are we seeing my slides now? Yes. Great. Okay. <laughs> uh, so hello to everyone uh, at the panel today and to, to my fellow panelists. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here today and have the opportunity to share with you information about my work with entity recognition and linked data for archival materials. Uh, and I should note that um, I work with a number of other people at Kent State, specifically uh, Marcia Zeng, and she's with us on the panel. So I already welcome her to uh, <laughs> say some things at the end of what I'm gonna say, because I'm sure she has more to add. 
so the plan for today is to talk a little bit about some of the challenges in providing access to archival materials, specifically limits of current approaches and possibilities that linked data provides to improve discoverability of archives. And then I'll talk about a recent small scale project uh, that I've been working on with my colleagues that showcases those challenges and opportunities uh, for using linked data for event-based description for a particular set of archival materials related to the May 4th collections at Kent State University. So this is a project that's still in process, but I think you'll find that it eliminates the problems and possible solutions fairly well. So um, we've had a lot of activity in the last two decades on digitization work, increasing the number of documents, photographs, and other archival material available in open digital archives worldwide. Um, but these valuable resources are often hard to discover. And a lot of that is due to the way archival materials are described and cataloged. Uh, so these collections represent a tremendous source of untapped data, which isn't discoverable without significant effort on the part of the researcher. So linked data represents uh, a new approach, new, new to archives, <laughs> Uh, to um, information access. So going beyond the tagging and the indexing using those predefined set of topics. And it relies on semantically structured data embedded within collection inventories or even in the documents themselves to be able to interlink this information and make it searchable through semantic queries. So this is something that is quite familiar to this audience. I don't, I'm sure I don't have to sell anybody on linked data. <laughs> Uh, so um, the traditional methods for describing and representing archival material uh, are, you know, it, 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 I, I won't go into the whole history of why the archives are described the way they are, but I can tell you some of the things that, that make them challenging to, to search within. So there's a lot of unstructured data. We have a lot of blocks of text that describe things like the creators of the materials, the scope and the contents of the materials. And we have inventories that have things like file folder headings, um, which may all contain entities, but none of these tend to be recognized or tagged as such. Um, there's also the situation where a lot of archival materials are described at multiple levels. Archival materials tend to be organized hierarchically and so you would start a description at the top level describing the entire collection, but then there would be multiple levels underneath it describing at smaller groupings. So uh, in archival speak, so it'd be things like series, files, items within uh, files. So, so that makes their descriptions tend to be a lot longer, a lot more complex. Um, we also don't have, um, a lot of good authority work going on for archival entities, particularly names of persons. There are a lot of, a high percentage of uh, named entities that uh, have never appeared in any um, archival, I'm sorry, in any authority files. Uh, a third thing is geographic names. We know that geographic names change over time. And so we may have geographic names embedded in our descriptions uh, that may not correspond to the currently accepted form of the name or the name may have changed completely. Uh, lastly, we don't have a lot of agreement or standardization about what the appropriate depth of indexing is for these materials. So um, how useful is it to tag all of the entities in an archival finding aid or in a, a document or a set of documents? There's not a lot of agreement about that. So these are all big challenges that we're facing. So I just wanted to show you an example. These are a few slides that um, display the, uh, some of the challenges. This is the beginning of a finding aid for a set of papers that are part of the May 4th collections at Kent State Libraries. And uh, you can see some things that clearly correspond to a, you know, a Dublin Core um, metadata record or to a MARC catalog record. 
Uh, but also you start to see places where there are entities that are not, uh, there is no uh, identification of, of a particular name in them. So you might see you know, the May 4th Commemoration Committee, May 4th Task Force, May 4th Coalition. So are these necessarily indexed? Uh, so these are some of the unstructured text blocks that we're dealing with. And so there may be multiple entities buried within them. This is actually a shorter one. There can be much longer ones than this. Uh, so not to uh, spend too much time on this, this particular collection did have um, Library of Congress subject headings assigned to it, um, but you know they tend to be pretty minimal. So we do see the coalition and the task force headings, but there are a lot of other headings that are embedded in both the, um, that, those earlier text blocks. And then also this is a sample, it's a snippet from the inventory listing and just the first two folders of the first series, remember I said, things are organized hierarchically. So we have multiple series and then multiple folders within these series. So one personal name and two corporate body entities not indexed. So over 95% of the entities found in an inventory listing are not typically indexed in any way. So we certainly can search these training aids manually, but there's no easy way to find other records in the repository that have the same entities other than through a manual search of the inventories. Uh, so, and, and then of course, there's the issue of not tagging entities semantically. So we don't know what the personal names are, corporate names are. Um, there, it, there was the encoded archival description standard that was used to mark up the finding aid for the display, but it, most institutions find it very time consuming and cost prohibitive to individually tag each entity throughout the finding aid. So, all, so typically only index terms are indicated with any sort of semantic tagging. So link data. So here's a potential way out of this problem to increase discoverability of archival information by embedding that semantically structured data into collection inventories and then into, at least for textual documents, the documents themselves. And that allows us to interlink, uh, interlink related information and make it searchable uh, through semantic queries. So uh, now I want to segue into um, a particular project that I've been working on with colleagues at Kent State. Uh, and this one uh, is, so this is focusing on a particular set of records that has been combined together and, and labeled as the May 4th collections uh, by Kent State University Libraries. So, uh, so this particular project's Folks, uh, this particular project focuses on the difficulties of finding information on historical events in the archival collections. So we wanted to focus on events because we thought for this particular collection or set of, of records, uh, it, events, uh, the event itself, so the overarching event of what happened on May 4th was uh, very, very important to the university and has also become very important uh, to um, the nation, the nation's history. So this was a tragedy uh, where there was a, a war demonstration, anti-war demonstration, and um, the Ohio National Guard uh, was called out and ultimately four students were killed and, and nine others were injured during this event. So, um, it, it definitely lends itself to looking at event description. And uh, so events are special form of named entities. They serve as a nexus point that marks a relationship between specific agents, places, and points in time. They're a type of gathering mechanism for records of actions are, and they're crucial aspects of archival information systems. So being able to search by um, events and people and places that are uh, in times that are related to events, uh, very important. So the goal for this project was to explore how historians and other humanities scholars can most effectively access and use the data hidden in the silos of digital archival collections to craft narratives about significant developments and critical junctures in historical events using linked data and event-based description. 
So we were really targeting historians in this particular project um, with the assumption that they, uh, so, so you know, they, they do their research in a particular way where they're crafting narratives, they're, create, they're creating a story and they're gathering evidence to support the telling of that story. So we had several research objectives that is, are associated with this project. We're still in the first objective, which is to look at the efficacy of an event-based model of description to facilitate search across archival inventories and the textual documents found within the collections. Ultimately, we'd like to be able to develop some sort of tool that'll help scholars to be able to navigate uh, through these documents, find these hidden nuggets of information and the relationships, you know, you know, looking at, at records across these various collections of different provenances. Uh, and then we want to be able to create historical event vocabularies and ontologies from entities derived from the archival materials and be able to create and test that event-based model. So uh, just so now to the, the preliminary pilot work that we've done, um, we gathered uh, finding aids, captions of photographs and oral history transcripts to be able to uh, run them through a semantic uh, analysis engine. So in this case, we used the tools Open Calais and Cogito to extract entities. From those uh, HTML, HTML files, excuse me, HTML files, we uh, converted those to text and then process them using a tool that uh, was homegrown developed by one of our students called the semantic analysis method tool to create CSV files. And we placed those entities in separate columns. We did data cleanup. We removed extraneous characters and spaces, corrected miscategorizations, uh, added geographic coordinates based on geographic location and date. We also did date normalization. So we used a combination of open refine and manual collection. We did some additional post-processing work where we added URIs from VF, LC names and Wikidata. We enriched geographic names from GeoNames and the thesaurus of geographic names. And we also uh, captured uh, certain things like the corporate body names and uh, media outlets such as newspapers and uh, broadcast station names. So all of these could be considered potential entry points to the archival records. So this is just a, a quick table that gives you a sense of the number of entities that can be found in just this small sampling. So of 111 finding aids, we uh, found 171 unique geographic names over 1500 personal names. Um, facility and building names turned out to be very important, 386 of those. Uh, and then over 2000 references to dates or times. Uh, so that is very significant. Uh, we have uh, also photographic captions, a pretty small sample, we just did 30, but it, tended, it, it was fairly labor intensive for some of this work. Uh, oral history transcripts, 108 of them. And so you can see similar numbers there. So we found out when we did this uh, entity recognition is that building names became very important early on in our process. So we, you know, we made sure to capture that. We also discussed the fact that because of the nature of this particular set of events, it, uh, the placement of actors in, in a particular location. So where people were on the campus when this event happened um, would be very important and was often mentioned. So it was a kind of geographic placement mentioning, but how do you represent that, uh, you know, semantically? Representation, representation of time was also uh, a concern. So you can express time concretely, such as a particular date and time, or contextually, such as two minutes after the shooting stopped. We need to find ways to express contextual time statements in our data model for this project. Um, also, uh, uh, you know, being able to, to somehow code all of this 
it takes a lot of time. So data cleanup and analysis took a lot more time than we thought it was going to, uh, but we should, probably should have predicted it would take a lot of time. Uh, so I, um, so that's kind of where we are with this. I just wanted to mention a few uh, possible influences for us as we work towards developing an ontology for this. So there are a lot of event ontologies out there. Um, there's this one by um, Yves Rimmel and, and Samir uh, Abdullah, the event ontology, uh, which was originally developed for a music production environment. And then um, the uh, Ryan Shaw load ontology uh, for linking open descriptions of events. So um, we are definitely going to be looking at, uh, I, and I think also the work of um, Ira Havonen, uh, which in one of our keynote speakers for this conference is also going to be very relevant. So what will we do next? So we plan on trying to develop and test that prototype tool for event information discovery and use. Um, so anybody that's interested in building historical narratives, so historians, students, uh, people in American studies, or um, people interested specifically in the history of this event, this is a, the May 4th event is very important and widely recognized as a key event in American history. So we expect that there will be a lot of interest in trying to help us test this kind of tool. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's one thing that we wanna do uh, is develop and, and, use, and use the tool to test the validity of an, the event-based model that we're working on. Um, so we want to provide some sort of model for empowering humanities researchers to build complex historical narratives from various primary and secondary sources, and ideally make the model adaptable beyond our current project. Are, are these models going to be specific only to certain situations or is there's a way to extrapolate that and people be able to adapt it to other, other collections, um, other projects? So uh, I think I'm pretty much at the end of my time. And I'd like to thank the um, College of Communication and Information at Kent State, which funded, partially funded this project through their Research and Creative Activity Fund. And thanks to my iSchool research team, uh, Marcia Zhang and uh, Virginia Dressler, who's at our university libraries. Uh, and then we had a postdoctoral scholar and graduate research assistants who also worked on it. And uh, I think that, that just a few sources. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Karen. Uh, the, the, you know, we, I think the example of May 4th uh, event at uh, Kent State is a great example for the event ontology. Uh, but anyway, um, any questions from the audience? Um, I see quite a few. <laughs> uh, knowledge graph alignment algorithms, no, but we will most certainly look into it. I think that's an important step for us. Okay. Um, yep. Any other? Well, maybe we'll uh, have uh, more time. Uh, at the end to ask uh, questions for our uh, panelists. Um, our last present, uh, presenter, uh, but not least one, is Kate uh, Polly, Catherine Polly, and who is a research assistant, also a current Master of Library Information Science student uh, at the iSchool of uh, Syracuse University and she works uh, at the uh, metadata lab, um, you know, work with the metadata lab team. And please welcome Kate to give us uh, her presentation. Hello, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me get my slides up. All right, everything all set? You can see? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Um, so today I'd like to present a little bit about um, a project that I've been working on with the Metadata Lab, as Dr. Chen mentioned, about named entity disambiguation for archival collections. So, 
Uh, for a little bit of background, this uh, particular project grew out of the Linked Archives project, which started a couple years before I got to Syracuse. Um, but basically the idea of that project was about taking the metadata for three special collections in the Syracuse University libraries and modeling them as linked data. Um, so the collections in question, we have the Belfer Cylinders collection, which is all music and sound recordings, the Ronald G. Becker collection of Charles Eisenman photographs, which is a bunch of photographs of sideshow performers and such, and the Ted Koppel collection, which features um, news programming with Ted Koppel, such as Nightline. Now, within um, the larger metadata ontology that was created by previous students for um, these collections, uh, the names entity to disambiguation part of the project focused specifically on the people that were referenced within the metadata. Um, so this shows a little bit of how they related. So we have people or a person entity with a first name, middle name, last name, and the role, which is how they relate to the collection, whether they were the subject of a photograph or an interviewee on Nightline or something of the sort. And they could be related to subjects or to items within the collection. And those would be related to other objects then in turn. Now, as you can see from, um, that little visual, we didn't have a whole lot of information in the original metadata about um, the people. So we wanted to see what we could do to enrich that metadata with additional information and properties specifically from Wikidata. Uh, so Wikidata, we've, has been mentioned several times already today. Um, and that's based on Wikibase, which is actually open source. So we could create our own instance of Wikibase in order to put our own linked metadata into it. And uh, the big reason why we wanted to um, do this metadata enrichment with Wikidata is because like I said, our initial, our initial met metadata didn't include, include a whole lot of information about the people. Um, so we wanted to add a little bit more to help researchers conduct more interesting queries and assist in their research. Um, but first, in order to get that additional information from Wikidata, we have to go through the process of named entity disambiguation, which in some sources is called entity linking. And in order to do this, we looked around at several different sort of tools or methods for um, doing this process of entity linking. And we ended up choosing one tool called Open Tapioca which is open source. It has a web interface that you can see on the right here um, where you just paste in text and it will pull out the named entities and attempt to connect those to entities in Wikidata. And we chose this one because it was one of the few that used Wikidata and was out there to be able to use without going and building your own tool or having that um, more technical knowledge that you know, a lot of librarians and archivists might not have. So this, we wanted to test out something that was a little bit more accessible. Uh, so now I'm gonna go into a little bit about our experimentation and what we learned about using this tool in the context of archives. Uh, first, I should specify, we really focused for this experiment on the Bill for Cylinders collection. Uh, we wanted, to focus on a collection where the people were recognizable enough to actually show up in Wikidata. Because um, obviously there's a limit to who's in there. So something like the Charles Eisenman collection, there were most of the people that were named in there didn't show up in Wikidata, which doesn't really help us with the entity linking. Uh, we also wanted something with a reasonable size and scope. Um, so the Belfer Cylinders collection was about 700 person names in there. And it was all focused around music. So it was easy to, when we were confirming manually how good the matches were from the Open Tapioca tool, it was more straightforward to see, yes, this person is uh, the right one in the collection. Uh, so out of those 700 names, what did we get? 
um, when we were man manually matching, so just a person going in and saying, okay, this um, name in the collection refers to this item in Wikidata, we were able to confirm about 79% of the collection. Um, some, there were definitely no match. Others, there wasn't enough information in Wikidata. So for example, the, um, the entry just had a name and no properties about them. That happens sometimes. So we couldn't really say one way or another whether or not that was the right person. And then Open Tapioca did fairly well with um, also matching the ones that we knew had a match. Um, so about 85% it got right. Um, and then others, 14% it got wrong. Sometimes it didn't properly recognize the name, but that was a really rare occurrence. However, we should note that within those 85% um, getting correct, the tool wasn't very confident in its matches. It was more confident, um, you can see in these distributions, when it was right than when it was wrong, which is a good sign, but that being more confident was still around zero confidence, <laughs> uh, which was better than the negative scores that some got. Um, but you could tell that it wasn't, it wasn't built to work with the kind of data that we were giving it, um, but it was it was reasonably effective um, on a on an initial pass through. So, what can we take away from all of this? What's the point? Um, why do we care? Well, uh, this little experiment pulled out some interesting points that we want to consider when doing this sort of entity linking. For example, considering your knowledge base and the scope of your collection. As I was saying before, certain collections, just the people that you're working with might not necessarily show up if you're using Wikidata or whatever other knowledge base you're basing your entity linking um, program off of. Also, it's important to consider what metadata elements you have and which ones are actually going to be useful for that entity linking, whether you're doing it manually or with a program. So for example, the, the properties that we had specifically tied to people, we just had names and roles, which was very much in the context of collection. However, um, there, was, there were certain things that we could infer based on their relation to other things in the collection. So for example, for the Bell for Cylinders collection, we know it's all about music and sound recordings. So we're gonna get people in there that are composers or musicians. And it was focused in a specific time period, the late 1800s, early 1900s. So we could say, all right, this person was alive around this time period. So that's a more reasonable match than someone who lived centuries before that. Um, so the, I guess the point of that is that we have to look at the data that we have and think, all right, what pieces of these are actually going to be useful and what aren't? And see what the kinds of inferences you can make and consider that when you're pulling out your metadata um, for doing this sort of linking. Another thing to consider is just the existing tools that are out there have their limits when applying them to different contexts, like using them on archival metadata. Um, typically, a lot of these things are used to working with free text, um, which you'd think is a more challenging thing than working with structured metadata, but it's, it's a little bit weird going back and forth when something is designed to take in free text and you're working with uh, more structured data. And also just the context that they're used to working with. A lot of these um, things like open tapioca were tested on news articles, more contemporary um, things like that, as opposed to more specialized archival collections that they might not be used to working with and finding matches based on that. Um, so all in all, this really just suggests the need for future work and research on the subject and sort of bridging the gap between librarians and archivists and the computer science side of things um, in order to create a tool that is more suited to these specialized contexts as opposed to the more general 
um, named entity disambiguation tools that are out there. Um, and that is all I've got today. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Good, wonderful. Um, thank you, Kate. Uh, before we uh, move to you know the question Q and A for the whole panel, do you uh, does anyone have uh, questions specifically to Kate's presentation? Looks like we can uh, go directly uh, into. Um, you know, the, uh, the Q and A session for the whole panel. Um, all right. Anyone? If, oh, we have a few, I guess people are busy typing. <laughs> all right. We got some. Compliments to our presenters. Great. Yeah, I, I really um, want to thank all our panelists and for such um, a very um, inspiring and, uh, you know, creative project. So um, I think I will take the advantage of being a moderator to ask the question that I had for uh, um, Anton. So uh, the question I had for uh, Anton's uh, presentation is, in your presentation, you mentioned about entity collection. Um, do you have, uh, uh, do you think this uh, collection will be able to play the role of authority uh, knowledge base or database? Uh, similar to, um, you know, AAT or LC's linked data service. Uh, thanks, Yan. That's a very good question. Uh, I may seize that opportunity to run away uh, <laughs> because that's, uh, that's certainly uh, not something Europeana wants to embark on. I mean, we, we are keen uh, to provide a, a data resource that, that could be useful in, uh, in, in some, some, some efforts, uh, including ours, of course. Uh, but, uh, but for us, we're, uh, yeah, we, we, well, first, we, we don't have the resources. Uh, I mean, we, we do a bit of curation, but uh, a, a bit like, uh, like Kai, we don't have the resources to do full scale uh curation of uh, of all entities so it's gonna look uh it's gonna look a bit a bit shaky when uh, when looking at the at the details so it's it's really meant to facilitate uh browsing and search uh not so much uh to be used as a reference to to create uh well or, or, yeah authority authority knowledge uh and, and actually we we, we sort of inherit that approach uh, from, from what Europeana stands for, uh, actually, even, even before uh, working on entities. So we, we do provide an access to, to objects, but we, are, we, are not, we do not really want to be the ultimate uh, reference source for data about these objects. So this is the role of the partners uh, that work with us. So the same way as Europeana build a service uh, that, that, that sits uh, on, on top of, uh, of existing websites and reference system for objects, uh, our entity collection should be also a thin layer uh, on top of existing, uh, existing authorities. So we, we, are, we really don't want to replace them. Uh, I mean, that, that, that can be some nice uh, reflection about having these authorities coexist. And hopefully maybe they could also, uh, uh, I mean, these different authority files could benefit from, from the fact of being linked to, to this uh, thin layer that bridges several spaces, uh, but we, we really don't want to replace them. Uh, we, we don't have the, the right uh, institutional context for, for doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's good to know. Um, yeah, I can see that, you know, complexities hiding behind this if you go for that direction. Um, 
Okay, I, I think uh, uh, Masha has a question for Kai. Uh, Kai, some, you know, answered in the chat already, but, um, you know, the Masha's question is, um, will you consider a strategy to develop the URIs, like what um, uh, IIIF, triple IIF has done? Like uh, there's a link there, but Kai, yeah. do you want to, uh, you know, explain it? I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, um, I mean, what, what they do at IIIF is basically to, to code a lot of uh, different criteria into the URI, which can be uh, very helpful for, for um, working with the data and uh, actually also even searching the data. Um, but unfortunately, my answer is simply no. <laughs> uh, we do not do this. Um, I mean, as I, as I wrote, uh, we, we have a relatively simple system. Whenever we get our data from one source, we assume, or of course, the source has to have an identifier on its own. They have to use something. And we just reuse it. That's why we have something like uh, Chodaika link slash dbpedia slash whatever is in the URI of dbpedia or slash gnd slash the gnd number. So we just reuse this. And for our entity pages, we obviously have to come up with our own uh, naming scheme. And yes, we just use the most boring thing possible. We just number them because we, we, we discussed it and we, we think it's ugly and, and very unfortunate, uh, but we, we really did not come up with a good idea that does not lead to naming conflicts and does not give us more complexity when we try to maintain these clusters. Because then we not only have to make sure that they hopefully are semantically correct, we, we also really have to make sure that the name still fits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Antoine, you have another question. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I wanted to elaborate on what Kai said, uh, the boring aspect of uh, using an incremental <laughs> token uh, for entity URIs. Uh, we've done the same at Europeana. And, and for what it's worth, we took that decision uh, after consulting with our community. So we were really not sure of trying to reuse existing identifiers or the labels of the entities that would be a bit more uh, sort of human friendly. Uh, all these stupid token. Uh, so in the end, we said, okay, we're we are not, well, we, we have our preference, but we are, we are going to delegate a bit that uh, decision to our community. And the poll was clear uh, that it should be a token. So then I, I don't know on which reason the person voted in majority for that, but they, uh, they did. So there was a couple of dozen persons in the European network who had an opinion, and we really welcome that. Great. Thank you. Um... Any other questions? Uh, Masha raised the hand. Yeah, go ahead, Masha. Well, I think you both gave um, a lot of thinking about how you can effectively use URI, especially when we're dealing with things change every day. I uh, so thought the IIIF is one way that the clustering and um, allow that one cluster have different, for example, quality, different, um, uh, it's just, a, I, I mean, it's a syntax based. But then on the other hand, I saw the, the WHO's uh, ICD, International Classification of Diseases was, giving what they call fundamental URI for the new ICD-11, because if you see the version 11 and version 10, they are completely different uh, notations. So if you look at the COVID-19 vaccine, there are so many different ones. Each, how will you be able to consistently uh, match the different versions of their own? So they're approach is different from IIIF. It's one unique permanently. And when you search that, it guide you to the browser to that entry. So I saw that two different directions. That's why I was asking you whether you consider pattern or not. And Tom Baker was also 
suggesting uh, was based on that uh, Cisaurus mentioned three days, three days ago, right? For the um, gender uh, equity Cisaurus, that URI does not, should not have a version number inside because then you change to version four, then you everything had to be changed. So I, I wonder whether you have any strategies or patterns or any uh, director decision that can be, everyone can benefit. Okay. Antoine, go ahead. Uh, yeah, for us, it's no version. Uh, because actually we, and I, I guess, all, uh, yeah, maybe that applies to other situation in the panel. I'm actually curious to, to hear whether the co-panel is seeing the same, but for us, when we started to think of this, we, we sort of, uh, well, we, we, yeah, we were stuck actually trying to identify what a different version would be. Uh, so we, it looked like uh, going into a rat hole of infinite discussions uh, what what would count as a as a different version? Uh, actually, uh, we, with another hat uh, on, because uh, I'm also involved in a vocabulary for representing right statements so or licenses that can be applied to objects. And in that case, we had actually quite uh, quite a very specific uh, view of what a version should count. So we versioned the URIs for these right statements uh, because every almost every change of words in a license. Uh, should actually be represented by uh, making that la the, the, the old one obsolete uh, so that people would not be confused. But for the entities, uh, we, are, we are really nowhere near that, that sort of fine-grained understanding of, of different versions. Great. Um, Chijen, I saw you shared a link in the chat. Um, can you Tell us what that link is for. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, this is an article uh, about uh, uh, how to give uh, entities and resources and vocabularies terms, uh, HTTP URIs in Shanghai library. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, um, much detailed in this article. Yeah. Great. Oh, sorry, uh, Anton, I, did I interrupt your um, reply to Masha's question? No, I wanted to ask a question to, uh, to Catherine and Karen and maybe uh, Kuyan. Uh, and actually, yeah. I see. so if I may? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, and actually, now I realize that Marsha has almost the same the same question as as I have. <laughs> uh, so that that's about the the confidence scores and the, and their validation. Uh, so I'm I'm going to let you uh, answer, and I think uh, that would be the same. I mean, the same question could apply to the the three of you, or at least Catherine and Karen, because they've applied uh, this uh, funny open tapioca thing, uh, and uh, open Calais may may have the same. Uh, so if there are confidence scores that are output by these tools, uh, so yeah, do you validate them? And during this validation, uh, uh, so when, when Catherine has shown this diagram about the, 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 yeah, the fact that some confidence scores were actually not so reliable, uh, did you get, uh, well, are you satisfied with the sort of transparency you got on, uh, of the working of the tool uh, for explaining those confidence? Yeah, that was actually one thing that I didn't really like about um, the tool was that they didn't explain very well what exactly those scores meant. And other than like, oh, this is, you know, how likely we think that's a match, but it didn't say much about how that was actually calculated. And based on, you know, comparing um, what we got versus what they got and considering how many different people came up for that person, like if there were a lot of names versus if there weren't very many names, it didn't always make a lot of sense as far as why they were really confident in this one for, and not very confident in this other one. Um, also based on, you know, the text that we input to it, it just, yeah, that was one of the rather unsatisfying parts of, 
our our experiment there. So I guess that replied to both Antoine and Amasha's question about the confidence uh, score. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And as as Karen found the same with with Open Calais. You are muted. Sorry about that. I had unmuted and then I muted again and forgot I was muted again. Uh, <laughs> um, because Open Calais and Cogito are are not, you know, the way they built, you know, their engines. It's it's it is not for archival material. It's for news material. Um, so sometimes, if it was a well-known name um, that would be out there in the news. Um, you could be fairly confident, but so many archival um, names, names that are in archival materials are very local. And so, so one would have less confidence with those. I'd have to go back, I'll, I'll, our graduate students did a lot of this work. So I'd have to go back to their work and, and see exactly what the confidence levels were or scores were. But uh, you know, it probably would directly correspond to um, you know, whether or not they were known in the news. Uh, not sure if that's helpful. But. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I would be curious to hear if there was a confidence value output by the tool. So not necessarily your evaluation, but whether Open Calais oh. said something like, oh, I'm, I, I trust this prediction that I'm making or I don't trust it. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I haven't looked at that that data in a while, so I'd have to go back in and look at it. I'm sorry. I wish I, my memory was fresher on that. Marcia, do you remember? Well, uh, for the Open Calais, now it's called intelligent tagging. The evidence what we had was that if it's for geographical place, yes. probably the best. And then um, other kind of, um, there's some related to the personal name, related to events, as long as they are favorite. However, if there are things not well known, then you won't get it. But the worst part is those suggested subject terms, those uh, keywords and things. Those, those were not usable for the most right. part. We are not using that mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. We had a, a very good discussion. Um, is there any uh, question, any other questions? I guess, um, you know, we are now very close to uh, the end of our panel. And um, I would like to take this time and thank you all for uh, great presentations and allow me to moderate this session. Uh, this is a true honor a thing to do. So, um, and this is, Today is a Thursday and tomorrow is our last day of the uh, DCMI virtual event and hope you um, have enjoyed uh, all the presentations at DCMI to, um, so far and uh, will enjoy the last uh, day of event. Um, and thank you all again and thank all uh, our uh, you know, <laughs> audience too. Um, have a great day or a great evening. <laughs>